Third John, if you have a real Bible, will read like this. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to the strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forth, Forward on their journey after a godly sword, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto Diotre or I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. So here's our last epistle of John. We finally uh, uh, reached the end. We've done 1 John, the general epistle, and here we are, 2 John last week, and now the third epistle of John. So we've walked through this, we've seen that in 1 John, basic and general ideas and topics are sent forth. The, the joy through Jesus. We talked about knowing Jesus and also knowing the Antichrist. We talked about showing whose son you are, about loving your brother, about knowing the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, and also knowing all these things and acting them out with confidence. In 2 John, we saw the elder unto the elect lady. A, a specific recipient of this letter, less general in its approach, I believe that this is a church, a congregation of believers, that was perhaps newly established. Uh, they were warned that deceivers will come that will bring in false doctrine. And therein I made the statement that I believe that these were coming in because they desire to fill a leadership gap that was perhaps there. Now, I didn't just make that statement up. I didn't just shoot from the hip and hope for the best. I had actually read ahead in the context. And I saw that that is exactly what happens to the elder and to the elect, or to the elect lady, rather, in the church that was there. I don't want to go there. I saw, and we saw, that as we walked through the epistles of John, that first there was the general broad approach. Then it narrowed in, and he, he was talking specifically to a church. And now here in the third epistle of John, he narrowed it even further, and his focus is being upon one Gaius. And I believe Gaius here is that leader that stepped forth within this congregation and, and showed himself faithful, and I'll get more into that as I move on. Now, forgive me for applying scriptures to myself. I mean, I've been accused and charged that, that, that I've taken great men of God, perhaps, from the Bible and applied them unto my own life, as if I was walking through a scenario that was reminiscent of a David or reminiscent of a Jeremiah. Um, but the truth is, I also take uh, situations like Samson. I take situations like, like uh, Jephthah. I take situations from all different types, and I apply them to myself. I don't just take the great men of God when they're at their highest and say, oh, this is just like my life. This is how things are going in my life. So, of course. No, I, I take each and every story that I find in the Bible and apply it to my own life. I use it as a mirror to my own life, taking the situations and the examples that we find in Old and New Testament and make them applicable unto myself. After all, I thought that that's what we're supposed to do. Doesn't 1 Corinthians 
10, read that these things were written for our admonition, for our learning, upon whom the ends of the world are come? Are we not to take the word of God and literally apply it into our own lives as if we're living in these stories and learning the same lessons that these men and women were learning as they walked through them? I believe that what is what the Bible is here for. It's there to be that lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path to show us, perhaps by bad examples, how men dealt with them and, and learn to not follow that same example. Or we look at good examples and say, hey, that's a great godly example. I'm going to endeavor to follow after that same example. I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's inappropriate to therefore read into what's going on here in 3 John and feel the Spirit of God pulling my heart into the story and, and, and aligning things in certain situations and circumstances that are going on in my life unto what's going on in this beloved brother of the elder, which is John Gaius, taking his life and applying it personally to myself. So in the actual context of the story, like I said, going from general to a church letter to specifically to Gaius, when he stepped in to this church, whether he was there before or not, whether he was in the church when the second epistle was read or when the, the first epistle was received by the same group, we know not. But when he stepped forward into this position where now he is being singled out specifically by the Apostle John. He was at a time when this church, I believe, was in great unrest. Uh, John earnestly desired the church in the second epistle that they would watch for deceivers, that they would reflect upon their selves, keeping their doctrine sure and pure and right in order that they would not be deceived. He said in verse 8 of that, look to yourselves that we lose not those things. So the charge was there, and I believe that the charge is there because there's a real and present danger. He's giving a warning that they need to apply to their own lives. In the same way, when, when, when I stepped into the situation that we was, was upon what we now know as Sound Words Baptist Church, um, there was great unrest here. There was great confusion. There was great turmoil within the ranks of those that would call themselves members of this congregation or of this body. I remember at that time I was exhorting some, I was encouraging some of the men from afar to do these same things, to watch for errors in doctrine, to watch for troublemakers, to watch for deceivers that would enter in at such a time, but to reflect on their own selves, to spend time in the Word, to spend time focusing in prayer with God. I remember encouraging brethren that some are here today and some are not, and they've gone other distance, other ways. But I encouraged them to stand fast, to look to yourselves, to be in the right way and in the right path with God doctrinally and positionally and in your actions when things start to come together in God's appointed will and His appointed time. And when I was invited to come and to join in with this group, it was soon after revealed in the same way that it's revealed in our brother Gaius's story here, that there was diatrophies is waiting in the wings ready to seek to please themselves, ready to seek to have preeminence among the group and to perhaps fall into a leadership void that was there. So I apply this very specifically to my heart, and this is just what it speaks to me when I read it. I read that there was a general epistle, that there was then focus on the church. And then now he's speaking to an elder that perhaps stepped forth in the ranks. Perhaps he was sent, perhaps he arrived later, perhaps... We don't know the story of it, but either way, there's now a specific man being singled out in the writing of John, and he's going to deal with him in this area. So as this story unfolds, again, there's that general letter to the locale. It's based and specifically geared toward simple truths of the faith, basics of the faith about how to walk, about how to treat one another, about who Christ is, about who the Spirit of God is. And though it's written very deeply and, and sincerely in a fashion that you know it's only towards uh, believers that are further along in their faith, that are growing in their faith still, but need to be exhorted to a higher plane of living, to that everlasting life that God gives unto those believers that should choose to accept it. <clears throat> But then he focuses in the second epistle, and now what I believe happened was a group was formed. I think that a general epistle went out all over the place, pretty much wherever John would go, or he would send men to go. That, that, that epistle was being copied and read in churches and in groups. I believe that out of the recep reception of that first epistle, a group formed. 
I believe that these principles that he taught of being watchful and loving one another uh, began to be lived. That elect lady came together. It was a congregation because we see that elect lady had many children with her. And they began to live these principles. And in infancy, this church, this congregation of believers, was in much danger because I believe that there was a void. This is why he kept saying, you know, I, I, will, I will come unto you. I'm not going to write with you in pen and ink. I plan to come and to visit you because he wanted to help alleviate that void that was left there in the meanwhile, giving them exhortation to watch for the dangers of these infiltrators that would come in trying to fill a void in leadership for the purpose of self-aggrandizement, lifting themselves up, having the preeminence. And with all this going on, the third epistle of John goes out Knowing that a congregation has been formed around the teachings of that general epistle that went out, a man stands up and he presents himself with a, here am I. We don't know much about the story of Gaius, uh, though there are clues within the, the Bible. I still find them a little bit unclear in connecting all of the dots and heaven will certainly meet the man Gaius, though I'm... I've, I've learned that that was a very popular, very famous name at the time, so uh, any of the Gaiuses that I find could, could be him or could not be him. Either way, he steps out and he becomes the focus of John's attention. Remember I said last week that the, he, he wrote that he would come because there was perhaps a need, and if there wasn't that need for a leader to teach these different doctrinal truths about watching, about deceivers entering, about specifics of doctrines, and he charges them to then look to themselves in that time of transition. Um, I said if there was a specific man there who could have taught them all these things, he would have appointed the letter specifically unto him. And so that's what I believe we see in the third epistle. Now he has found that man who is going to watch over the doctrine, who's going to watch over the soul so that men don't have to look to themselves so much. Though that is always an exhortation that we should look to ourselves and help to receive that full award. But now there is an overseer, whether his title is... Is, is bishop or evangelist or what have you. Again, the Bible is unclear on this, but I believe he has stepped forth and set himself forth as that clear leader. And at the same time, adversaries, the ones that were warned about in the second epistle of John, they arrive, they start causing trouble, and we see all that just as John expected play out. So who is Gaius? We see that um, the first mention that I found of Gaius is, is one of Macedonia, Acts chapter 19. He is a companion and fellow traveler with Paul. Uh, in the next chapter, we find a Gaius of Derby, and specifically uh, the writer, which was um, uh, Luke, said specifically this is Gaius of Derby, and though those chapters are so close together, I think he's, he's distinguishing them, the Gaius from Macedonia and the Gaius from Derby. Those are two di very different places, though we see that in the travels of the Acts of Apostles, they both seem to cross paths. They'll be in Macedonia, and next thing you know, they're passing through the areas where Derby is. Um, and back and forth, but uh, he, he specifically said that there is a different locale there. And this guy of Derby, he traveled uh, through Greece and Asia and up to Macedonia, and that's when I say they kind of cross paths, along with the Apostle Paul at this time. Um, we find in 1 Corinthians a... Uh, a Gaius that was baptized of Paul. He was one of a few that were baptized specifically by the Apostle Paul. And also in Romans chapter 16, there is one that one Gaius that is a host of Tertius who wrote the book of Romans, um, penned it for Paul anyways, um, and also a church. He's hosting that church, and that's in Corinth. So I take um, each of these, and I kind of analyze where they are and what they're doing at certain times, and... To me, the one that stands out that could be uh, this Gaius most is the Gaius of Derby. Uh, his, his, his relation with Paul is a little bit distant. He wasn't baptized of him. He wasn't uh, called a fellow traveler. He wasn't uh, one that hosted him. This Gaius of Derby simply seemed to join in with many other, mans, you can, many other men, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 20. Um, all of them setting forth together to do this trip from Greece to Asia to Macedonia. He seems as somebody who's not so closely associated with the Apostle Paul. And this is why I think he might have been somebody that while he was in Derby, which is not too far from where the Apostle John was living, he might have been reached by the Apostle John through his ministry and through his outreach and through his soul winning. And therefore, since, since we see the baptized Gaius that was of Macedonia being 
being associated with Paul. I think Paul's ministry was what grabbed a hold of him and led to the salvation of his soul. Whereby, whereby this one, I think is more likely the Gaius of Derby was reached by the Apostle John. To me, it wouldn't make sense when, when, when Paul was taking people and baptizing them immediately after they were saved, that someone that got saved maybe over in Derby, who is known as John's child, when he says in verse 4 of the third epistle of John, would then wait a little while, go meet up with the Apostle Paul, and then be baptized. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense, because the Bible pattern is your saved, you're baptized within that very hour, or as soon thereby. Either way, all that to say this, who is Gaius? I believe it's perhaps Gaius of Derby. He just seems to be a uh, lesser known. He's not a traveler with Paul. He's not connected by baptism or a specific church. He's a potential child of John. Either way, he's a man that John, and if you go back to the third epistle of John, if you're there, verse 1, John specifically loves in the truth. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And so John sends out his heart to this man in, in a very specific way. He is a well-beloved man of the Apostle John. And he says this in verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So he loves him in the truth, and now he wishes prosperity upon him. He specifically mentions in health. So that's your physical, that's your mental capacity to be able to go about and do your business without pain or anguish or this, the, the affirmities of the flesh that we so often carry. But he says this, that your soul would prosper. He wished you would have prosperity even as your soul prospers. Now this isn't, as we know, that specific prosperity that has to do with dollar signs and driving a really nice car. Now this prosperity, and if you were to just walk through uh, Genesis chapter 39, I won't go there for the sake of time, you'll see the story of Joseph where in verse 5, he is greatly blessed of the Lord. The Bible records that Joseph had, he was goodly and well favored. He had the, the riches of the kingdom within his hands. And we're like, yeah, see, that's prosperity. And he's described in that context in Genesis 39, verse 2 of 4, as one that is prosperous. And that's what we look at and go, yeah, that's prosperous. But then after that, a story takes place whereby this harlot woman approaches him and tries to seduce him, grabbing a hold of him. He's shown and revealed as, as, as she lies about him that he came at her and he tried to seduce her. The story is being switched. And he's cast into prison for it, loses everything. And the Bible records that the Lord was with him. And it says that everything that was in the care of now, not the king, but the prisoner, was now in his hand. It says Joseph was very prosperous. The one thing that connects these two events isn't how much money he had or how much money he didn't have or how much he was over or how much he was not over and responsible for. The thing that connects them is the statement, the Lord was with Joseph. And that's prosperity. That's biblical. That's Christian prosperity is when the Lord is with you. You are prospering when you are walking with him. You are prospering when you have fellowship with him rather than the unfruitful works of darkness. So the prosperous soul and spirit, the mind, will, and emotion of a man is only such when it is yielded unto the Spirit of God, when it knows that Spirit of truth, when it is one and yoked up with God Himself, when it is in the branch of Christ. That is when your soul is prosperous. And this is what John wishes to his beloved guys, that he would remain prosperous in that way. Yes, also have health, also have fleshly uh, comfort in that area. But prosperity of the soul, I believe is the focus here. So verse 3 says this, and this is, this is Gaius again, John mentioning of him that he rejoiced greatly when he heard of the brethren coming. For I rejoice greatly, verse 3, when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. So it was interesting that way back in 2 John in verse 12, I don't know how long these passages were apart. And again, I'm going on my interpretation that these are all in line, they're linear in their writing and specific to a same group of people. But it's, no, it's interesting that you see there in verse 12, the Apostle Paul saying he, or the Apostle John, sorry, saying, I trust to come unto you. And he's saying that um, with, with the assurance and faith that you would expect of an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially one that penned the writings in the scriptures. But he doesn't get there. So I don't know if many years went by or a few months. Um, he rather hears of 
the truth in this beloved Gaius through brethren that come unto him first. It seems that they showed up and they testified of Gaius that he was one that walked the truth that he heard. Just as the Apostle John has been exhorting them time and time again to take that truth and practically walk it out, practically live it out. Know these truths for certain, but then walk them. Don't just be one that is full of knowledge about the, the scriptures, rather be one that walks in those truths. As ye have heard, ye should walk. That's what we got in the second epistle in verse 6. And so this same great joy is received as he hears it from the brethren. He didn't necessarily go and see it himself. We don't see that evidenced here. But we see brethren coming and rejoicing of what is happening uh, in this area. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And his heart is just over flooded with the fact that he has heard that his children, uh, not of birth necessarily, but of the faith, those that he had seen saved by the Lord, those that he had ministered to, those that he oversaw, and whether they were near or whether they were far, his great joy was to see his children walking the truth, not just knowing it. And in verse 5 it says this, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sword, thou shalt do well. So this good report continues uh, as the men, the brethren, brought it to the Apostle John of this Gaius whom he knew, who I again believe he singled out as a leader over this congregation of the elect lady. Um, he sees this good report continuing to come to fruition that the Apostle John then affirms his faithfulness as he had seen it in him when they were together and as also he had heard it borne witness. He also sees that the same witness comes from the church through these men, that same charity he starts to see in him and he makes sure to affirm this and to make this good report known as he writes this epistle unto him. And also he shows and points out that this charity that was witnessed by the church, was witnessed, acted out, not only to brethren, but also to the strangers that would come in. He was one that had that same kind of love towards the brethren, that same kind of charity towards the brethren, as those that were without at that time. So verse 6 talks about the church recognizing this. And he said, now, when these brothers come by, he says, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sword, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. So here's a little bit of exhortation. And this is... One of the reasons why I think maybe Gaius has not quite been ordained as the bishop, but rather he has stepped forward as the man that, that seems to be next in line, seems to be most fit for that position. He has been singled out by the apostle. He's starting to hear these testimonies that he is faithful, and he knows this because he's met him, that he is uh, one who is faithful towards brethren and those that, that are without, showing his love. But then he gives this little tip of exhortation where he says we ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers with the truth. So there is a hospitality gap within this man's ministry or at least something that he can improve in. He says, hey, when these men come through, we therefore ought to receive such. We ought to be fellow helpers of the truth by helping men as they pass by within their ministry. So he's saying, grow here. He's saying, he's saying this is an area where you need more work, guys. He's encouraging him after that manner. And so with all of these warnings that apply, with all of this lifting up of his, his great character traits, this Gaius, and also giving him rooms for exhortation and for encouragement, and again, the warnings of keeping yourself firm in the doctrine, looking to yourself, all these being applied is testified by both the church and the elder. He now begins to get to the topic at hand. And this is where my thoughts that the church was at risk of a usurper coming in sort of come to fruition because he says there in verse 9, I wrote unto the church. Okay, so I think this is potentially pointing back to that second epistle of John. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Them being the congregation. So he wrote unto the congregation, but Diotrephes did not receive us. Now, does this mean that maybe the letter didn't even get to the hands of the church at that time? Uh, I don't know. 
But there was some sort of intervention from Diotrephes because it says, I wrote unto the church, but. And every time we see that big B-U-T, we know that there's a, a contrast happening. So he wrote to the church, but Diotrephes. He wrote unto that elect lady, but Diotrephes. And so that's where I got that idea from that perhaps the apostle in the second epistle saying that he wants to, tr he trusts that he's going to come unto them was because he wanted them to be aware of the dangers and he wanted to try to alleviate some of the fears of this congregation that's come together through the teachings of the first epistle. Um, and then he wanted to make sure and, and, and guide them as they came to their guidance, as they came to the man who would one day be their bishop. So he wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes. So did the letter make it? We don't know. Did, did he intervene in some way? We don't know. He didn't receive us. So perhaps it was read and he just kind of rebuked and put it off and didn't, didn't deal with what was actually contained in that second epistle. Again, I don't know for sure. But either way, the Apostle John writes this next letter that his deeds would be fully known. Look at verse 10. It says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. Prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So he, he's prating, this diatrophies. He's talking at length with foolish and malicious words. Again, applying that to my own life, I experience that same thing from a diatrophies, right? Not content therewith. The con Contentment was lacking because there was always this desire for, for something more. And Diotrephes exhibited these same behaviors towards the church and towards Gaius. He was divisive, the Bible teaches, that he would take others and cast them out of the church who would receive others. He was very specific in his attacks, saying, I don't like who they're fellowshipping with. I don't like who they're yoked together with. I don't like that Gaius is involved with this John. Who is this John? He's just some old timer. He, he's not of any interest to me in this ministry that I am breathing and breeding and, and creating here with the elect lady, within the elect lady and her children. He wasn't interested in that, and therefore he was divisive. And why was he this? What was the worst thing that built the man, Diotrephes, into these deeds and these acts which he committed afterwards, it was what it says in verse 9. It says, he loveth to have the preeminence among us. His greatest desire, which I alluded to when I preached on the second epistle, was that he would step into the gap and have preeminence among the elect lady, preeminence among that same church, preeminence among that group of believers, and that he would eventually be the leader. And how did he, how did he act out what was in his heart, the love for preeminence, the love for the spotlight and the focus to be on him? Well, he did it by, by prating, by using malicious words, by showing his discontentment with everything that was going on and being divisive, always whispering, backbiting, hating, and acting it out in that way. And that was Diotrephes. That was his ministry to this church. Now, in contrast, and when I apply this to myself, I hope that when everything went on in those past three months that my general bent was that I did and, of course, will to do things that would give Christ the preeminence. I wanted Christ to be lifted up in all things. Again, recognizing that I can take characters from the Bible who did really well and characters from the Bible that did really poorly and apply them all to my life and learn from them and grow in those areas. In contrast to the Diotrephes, I think, I think Gaius, and applying to myself even, I, I would have words that were not meant to harm, but rather meant to help. And I think for the most part, when I was dealing with these Diotrephes, and I was dealing with people that being swayed by the opinions of the divisive, foolish, and malicious words, I was one that did not speak back in the same way. I was, I was one that, it, it, my heart's desire was that I would help and not harm the situations. I received brethren, and it wasn't my purpose or intent or heart to divide unnecessarily. Now, there's always time for division, and I believe that very soon, you know, even the Apostle John, as he, as he outlines this, he's talking for, if I come, I will remember his deeds. He's, he's very clear that, that Diotrephes is going to be remembered and marked when he comes. And he's making the same charge to Gaius that he would mark this man in the same way. So there is a right time for division. And I have the same opinion of my diatrophies in my own life. They're, they're done. They're out. Okay, they won't be welcome back. That, that's it. It's cut off, right? The, as it stands right now, there is no need for that, um, for that fellowship. There is no need 
to receive those brethren. But I don't want to be someone that divides unnecessarily. I don't want to be somebody that's just constantly, if, if somebody receives someone else, if someone's friends with somebody else, if someone disagrees in a, in a, a few minor different instances, not just, not just divide. And this was the case with diatrophies here. He would just cast people out of the church who would even receive somebody who received the Apostle John. And that's not right. So... Being content is something that I, I, I really strive to grow in and admire. And I think, I think Gaius, in contrast to Diotrephes, would have been the same type of character, that he would be content with where he at. Like I said, I think he needs growth at this time. I don't think he's been officially ordained as the elder of the church there, but I think he's content with where he at. I think that he can wait, and I too can wait. If, if John continues to say, I will come, I can continue to wait. And Gaius, I believe, is the same way. Verse 11, John rightly judges. He takes this scenario whereby there is his beloved Gaius, and whereby there is this Theotrophes who loves to have the preeminence and pushes John away. And he judges thus. He says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. And in the direct context, you see one doing good, and you see one not doing good. This is his way of saying, hey, follow the one that's doing good. I I've laid before you two scenarios. I've laid before you a blessing and a cursing. I've put before you Gaius, and I've put before you Diotrephes. Rather, he, he just inserted himself, didn't he? And he says, brethren, beloved, follow not that which is evil. Follow not him that doeth evil evil because he hath not seen God rather follow him that is doing good in other words he's saying get rid of this diatrophies or leave this diatrophies or wherever he is and follow after the beloved guys and this is his encouragement here John rightly judges here now though absent John is then just as the Apostle Paul often did he's though he says though absent I I judge thus right he 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 judges that they ought to follow after the guys now, I think at this time, John is still having concerns about whether or not he's going to come there. Like I said, he's a great man of faith. And he said, I trust in the second epistle of John that I will come unto you. But in 3 John, in verse 9, he says this. I wrote unto the church. No, he says in verse 10, sorry. He says, wherefore, if I come. I will remember his deeds. So now we see that, that great trust that he is going to come, uh, come out as an if I come. Okay? So something has changed. There was, there was a dire need in the second epistle, and now enter Gaius, and there is an if I come. Okay? But he doesn't just uh, leave it hanging there. He said in verse 13, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be with thee. Our friends salute thee, greet the friends by name. So there is that if statement, if I come, if, if I come to this situation, and such and such will happen. But he again ends it with that trust. So there is a little bit of doubt in whether or not he's going to be there. I think these epistles were written at the end of John's life, perhaps just before he was sent to Patmos to spend the rest of his days penning Revelation and having that experience with God as, as, as that unfolded. But you see him write in the second epistle, I trust I'm going to be there. And like I said, it looked like his desires were, were imminent, like he really needed to fill that gap. Uh, I spoke that maybe that letter didn't in fact get there until a later date when they, when they exposed the atrophies and then they finally read that second later once Gaius stood up. But you see then this if come in. So there, there's not as much in imminent, imminency. There's not so much a need, I think, in, in his words as he says, if I come, I will remember his deeds. Almost as if I could come and, and remember his deeds, but hey, you're already there. <laughs> You've seen his deeds. You know his deeds. Gaius, uh, judge as I have judged. And, and, and he's giving, he's passing off that responsibility unto him. So, now, if he never got there, we got to ask ourselves, would Gaius remain content with the scenario that he was in? Would he remain in that same position, leading the church as he was, and doing what God asked him to do, doing what 
the elder, the Apostle John, had asked him to do, doing what the church had recognized in him, seeing his charity, that it goes to both the lost and to the saved, and seeing the truth that is in him as they testified of that truth. Would he continue to minister in that same way if he was never received officially and face-to-face -face by the Apostle John? And I believe he would. And I'm in the same situation. If that day never comes where, where, where my leader overseeing me comes, and, 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 and sees me off, or does his visit, or whatever. That proper ordination, which I don't think had happened in this scenario yet, though it might have happened later. I think there's kind of a, a history that tells that, that Gaius was the first um, bishop of such and such a church. What's happening here is, is he going to be content? Is he going to continue to serve God in that same manner? And I would like to think that I have the same heart to continue to serve the Lord in the same manner, with or without some title. Right? You are acting out, Gaius, exactly what you are responsible for. You have stepped forth as the leader, and you are ministering to brethren and strangers. You are showing your charity before the church. You are walking in the truth and showing the truth. Are you content with that? It's very clear that Gaius wasn't. He was one that wanted to have preeminence. He needed to have that, that title. He needed to have that position. He needed to have, and, and so much to the point where he would actually not receive others who would come in who would threaten that. He prayed it against them. He was not content. He would not receive brethren and he forbiddeth people and casteth them out of the church. He was one of those leaders who was just constantly afraid of things falling apart on him. And so he was constantly trying to uh, destroy people with his words. He was constantly praying against them. He was removing brethren that would bring in such that did not, dis did not agree with him, that were not in support of his desire for preeminence in this situation. But what happened here was that the Apostle John has that if statement. If I come, I will remember these deeds. In other words, I will set this right. But if I don't, I think he's passing the torch off to Gaius to do the same judgment. But he says this. He says, Beloved, in verse 11, follow not that which is evil, that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. And that's a clear charge of, of who to follow in this situation. But then he says this in verse 12. Demetrius, and whether he was one of the brethren that came to the Apostle John or not, I don't know. But Demetrius hath good report of all men. So here's another upstanding man. Here's another man that's known to have good report among them. And of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. It seems that the Apostle John has taken this Demetrius and essentially said, he's got the same record as us. He is one that is of good report of all men. He is one that bears that same record, and you know our record is true. Receive him. This is one that is trusted of John. He sent help. The Apostle John didn't think he was going to make it down there. Gaius is still growing. As we learned, he had to learn things about, about having, um, having uh, hospitality towards that, those that come through. Perhaps when he read the second epistle and, and, and learned about the deceivers entering in and trying to mix up the doctrine, perhaps Gaius' heart hardened a little bit to having visitors come in. And so John said, hey, you have to try to f fellowship with these that come through. You have to try to minister to them, be fellow helpers of that truth as it passes by. And then he says this, uh, Demetrius hath this good report. He also hath the truth, and he sends him to bear record of that same record that the apostle has. So he sends help. So in the whole of this scripture, I find this whole story play out. And honestly, before I read all of this in context and really, really preached through and, and thought about these things kind of week after week, I really had no idea how, how 3 John and 2 John and 1 John would ever tie together. But it's, but it's my belief, it just in my study and my meditation upon these words, that it's, it's a linear story. It goes from a very wide epistle to everybody, which I don't believe simply went to one locality. I believe it went all over the place. I believe that second epistle, again, narrows into the church that formed around these precepts, which narrows into then the leader, Gaius, who's still got some work to do, who is now taking the reins of that thing. But the apostle John knows that this is happening, though he's a busy, very busy man, and he may even be at the end of his life in this situation. So there's that if I come. 
But if I don't, I will send help unto you. And so that he ministers in that fashion whereby he can't be there as the direct overseer of Gaius. He can't be there to help him with every decision. He can only be there to encourage him from afar, to, to put his uh, approval upon him, to say that I know that you walk in the truth. I love you in the truth. I hope that you continue to prosper in that same way. The church is born witness of the same things that I know. But I want to send you help for the time because you're not quite ready to take over. So if I don't come, Demetrius hath good report. He will come unto you. He will minister unto this area until we close the gap and you're ready to take over. Until things like your, your, your heart for hospitality have grown and have blossomed and have grown. So he says this. John says, I wrote basics unto you. I warned you that deceivers would come in. And they came. And they did exactly what I promised they would. They seek to rise and to fill that leadership gap. But Brother Gaius, you have chose to take what was taught, apply it to your life, and live these very truths that I have taught. And I've seen that. And the church has seen that. And, and the, the strangers and the brethren are receiving of the blessing of your ministry that you have learned of me and now continue to live out because of what you've learned. And he says, continue in these things. He says, choose the good. He says, receive these men and just stay with what you're doing. He says, peace be to thee in that last verse. I trust to come unto thee shortly and we shall speak face to face. But peace be to unto thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. So we see another scenario whereby, whereby the friends, the fellowship, especially in these times when you can't just get into a vehicle and drive, we're very separate. They were very divided because land just separated between them. And as these churches started to grow up in different cities all over the world, as a church known, I believe, as the elect lady here at this time and her children blossomed and grew around the precepts that John was teaching, maybe as he just passed through an evangelistic mission, that started to grow. Elders started to come out of it. He started to recognize a Gaius, a man that he had known, a man that was his child. Perhaps he had seen him saved. And he, he recognizes that now we are starting to move towards the formulation, though I don't think it happened yet, I don't think it's been finalized, that this church would receive Gaius as they already have. They're doing all the things that they're supposed to do. They're acting out all the right things they're supposed to do. This man just doesn't have the position. And others have stepped in and they've tried to have preeminence, but hey, just keep waiting. He didn't have, speaking of diatrophies, he didn't have contentment. He didn't receive the brethren. He was constantly prating and running his mouth with malicious words because he wanted preeminence. Gaius learned from that fool's mistakes and grow and continue to love and show charity towards the church that you are overseeing in the time that you have been appointed to. I believe this is how the whole first, second, and third epistle of John kind of plays together. It's a really big picture and it gets focused in on just one man who stepped forth and the Apostle John getting behind him, sending him support, teaching him how he can grow in certain areas so that this would, which started off as a few men reading precepts who grew into a church who then had a leader step up within them to where they would be independent, yes, but fully realized in the truth and the way that they ought to behave.